Um, I direct cartoon voices, I write the Garfield show, and uh, we do, uh, I love working with cartoon voice actors. They are some of the most creative people in the world, as you will see, see in the coming hour or so. Uh, let me introduce you to some of the top people in our business, and there may be somebody joining us later, who knows. Uh, on the far end, I have two, I had two heroes when I was growing up. Uh, one of them was a genius named Stan Freeberg, if any of you people know who that is. Winchell, who was the greatest ventriloquist who ever lived. And he also did a lot of cartoon voices in his day, and it turns out talent is hereditary. His daughter has become one of the best actresses in the business. This is Miss April Winchell, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, recently, history was made in the video game business. They released a video game that Steve was not in. <laughs> But uh, you know this man from just about every video game you've ever played. This is Mr. Steve Bloom, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> now this next thing is kind of interesting here. here you, on the internet there's this website where somebody took the, uh, went to the internet movie database, and they took the grosses of every movie ever made, how much money movies have made, and they cross-referenced it with the people who've been in them to determine who was the top box office star who had been in the movies that had grossed the most money. And you'd think that would be like Samuel L. Jackson or Harrison Ford or you know, Rob Schneider or someone like that. And, uh, and it turned out, I got one here, this is from the 1990s, but it's, the number one name was Frank Welker, a voice actor because in all these things. Number two here is Phil Proctor. Number three is Samuel L. Jackson. Number four, Tom Hanks. Number five, Robin Williams. Number six, Bruce Willis. Number seven, Sherry Lynn. Number eight, Whoopi Goldberg. And number nine, Mr. Jack Angel, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> and sitting next to him is number 13, Miss Debbie Derryberry. <laughs> People have asked me, what do you get to get some of the Thundercats actors on here? Ladies and gentlemen, this is Matthew Mercer. <laughs> and another hero of mine, uh, anybody who grew up in New York knew this man's kids show in the, how many people here watched Chuck McCann's kids show in New York in the 60s? Five. They're all dead. Actors, uh, you know him on uh, the TV show Boston Legal, where he played Judge yeah. Fudd. You've known him from hundreds of commercials. We just know him as one of the great cartoon voice actors, Mr. Chuck McCann. As usual, I would like you each to tell us three or four of your most famous roles. Demonstrate the voices that you did for them, and then tell us something really obscure you did that we don't know was you. April, you're gonna get the start. Tell us where people have heard you. Start, start, with, start with Roger Rabbit. Tell us about your role in that. Uh, that was uh, Mrs. Herman, the, in the beginning. You just see her legs, and she's a beautiful, good boy, Roger, I'm going to the beauty parlor. <laughs> and, uh, and also the baby. Baby <laughs> Herman is a baby. Um, Muriel Fenchstar from Recess. You're a bunch of miscreants and boys. Lydia Pearson from Pepperano Peppy. Uh, <laughs> Cruella de Vil. That was one of the, I was the TV Cruella. Uh, uh, who else was I? I was, um, did you? I can't remember. Well, of course, I've been on Garfield, thank God. We just had a request from Clara Bell Cow. Oh, of course. How could I forget? for like 10 years. I call it my secret Disney shame. <laughs> it's not such a secret anymore. Now, oh, uh, hi, let's go to the glass piano. Whatever that means. There's always a glass piano and a, it's a lot of drug use, I think. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, as far as obscure, probably the, uh, I'm, I'm quite a few of the California talking cows. Uh, <laughs> one is a show off your butt cake. That one is running like crazy. That's all I can think of right now. Stupid anymore. Okay, Steve. Steve, uh, run down some of the games you've been in lately. 
The games I've been in? Just, just some, give, give Most of the games I can't talk about. There's lasers pointed at me. How about the, one, the ones that you can talk, you can talk um, about? Well, Guild Wars 2 is coming out very soon. Um, that was Stormtroopers in most of the Star Wars games. Ogren in Dragon Age, the drunken dwarf. Who, uh, his favorite line is, fart me a lullaby. <laughs> Grunt from Mass Effect. Tank Dempsey from Call of Duty, splattering zombies. Um, I'm also known as Wolverine from Wolverine and the X-Men. And uh, Spike Spiegel from Cowboy Bebop. Uh, Starscream from Transformers Prime. And most recently as a Mon from The Legend of Korra. stuff goes. This one I had to think about for a while, but I actually played an entire landscape made out of human feces. <laughs> for, uh, I, I think it was an incarnation of Dante's Inferno where it started out like... Yeah. <laughs> okay, something obscure you've done. Something obscure. Besides the human feces. More obscure than human feces? Yes. <laughs> uh, wow. How about something out of, from another era, area? Okay. Uh, well, I, I, or, uh, I've been the voice of 7-Eleven on and off. I'm the guy who says, oh, thank heaven. <laughs> That's pretty good. Yeah, pretty good. And uh, there was a show called Gurren Lagann. Which, it's an anime show for those of you who don't know anime, but but usually I, usually I get hired for all these really badass kind of characters. and. And this guy named Leron, his favorite line was, when you screw it in, give it a hard manly twist. <laughs> <laughs> he was a robot mechanic. Wash your minds, people. You're filthy. <laughs> okay. Jack, would you run down a list for me of some of the movies you've been heard in? What was that? A list of some of the movies you've been heard in. It's hard sometimes for them to hear me. Some of uh, up here, the... Acoustics are on. Some of the movies you've been in. Oh, uh, well, you, can I address one thing you mentioned at the at the introduction? You, you talked about that website that listed all the money that the movies made that I was in. And, and recently, Samuel L. Jackson, who just passed me on the uh, hundred million dollar movies, uh, was on Howard Stern's show, and. Uh, Stern said, well, who's Wilker and Angel? And he said, oh, well, those aren't real actors. Those are voice oh. actors. Oh. <laughs> it's a black guy. Well, I would, you know, like to put out there at, right now that anytime Samuel L. Jackson would like to show up in the studio with Frank Wilker and me, we'll see who the better actors are. <laughs> Most recently, I was uh, in Toy Story 3, I was Chunk. He was the guy, the guy he was one of the bad guys, a square little guy. He was talking about uh, uh, another character. He said, he said, you know, he's not the sharpest knife in the uh, place where they keep the knives. <laughs> <laughs> that was about the length of his part. <laughs> well, I say Chunk and people who like the show, oh, you were Chunk, oh, that's great. Um, uh, for years, I used to forget one of the most famous characters I ever did. I inherited this character when a good friend of mine, Gene Moss, passed away about 20 years ago, and I got to do the character after that. And it goes this way. Only you can prevent forest fires. <laughs> Until about two months ago, I was still smoky, and then I heard a new smoky on the air, and it was uh, Sam Shepard, hmm. who is the guy that said, that says a uh, 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 Dodge, <laughs> Dodge truck thing, you know, and, and so it, so now it's a, it's only you can prevent forest fires. <laughs> <laughs> it just doesn't sound the same, does it? <laughs> <laughs> And uh, Jack, you will impress the hell out of these people if you tell them about your roles on G.I. Joe, Transformers, and Super Friends. Wow. 
Okay. Uh, well, G.I. Joe, I was a uh, wetsuit, uh, who was a Navy SEAL. And uh, in the uh, Transformer, I was seven different Transformers. And there's a great, huge Transformer club. There are a hundred Transformer clubs out there. Uh, I got me on Facebook, and I'm inundated with Transformer things. Uh, and everybody has a different favorite one. And they say, well, do the voice. And I can't. They, tr they synthesized all those voices. And most of them were throat rippers anyway. I rule the universe! <laughs> and that kind of stuff. And if you do that three times, <clears throat> all of a sudden, <laughs> you go home and gargle to see if your neck leaks. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and uh, as far as Super Friends is concerned, I was Hawkman, The Flash, and Super Samurai. And hmm. Super Samurai was Japanese, and they wanted to make sure that when I said the Japanese words, they were correct. And so they dragged this guy out of the art department, who was one of the animators, and he had to be at every session to make sure that I could say, Tome Ninja! Exactly right. I don't even know what that means anymore, but it's a, it's a long time ago. Debbie. You? Yes. Yeah, yeah, but did Jack do an obscure thing? Uh, all of them are obscure. Uh, Jack. <laughs> Jack. I thought Spooky the Bear was a pretty good one, but Jack, Jack. Oh, okay, we have. Oh, that's right. There was a series called Peter Pan and the Pirates, and I was three, a couple of pirates in there. And, and one was for, I cannot ever figure out why, this pirate would talk like this, you know? <laughs> Have you ever heard a pirate talk like that before? <laughs> but he did in this series for 30 some odd episodes. I think my first Asian talked like that. Yeah, well, <laughs> Asians, that's different. Well, they are. They're pirates, too, aren't they? <laughs> I know why agents only get 10%? That's all they're worth. Yeah. Uh, Jack, 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 who's your agent? What? Who's your agent? Arlene Thornton. Oh. Is she here? Mm -hmm. She is here because she's my wife. <laughs> here, but so I can't see you, I'm not going to introduce you. All right, uh, Debbie, now tell us about you. Oh, hi Arlene, my agent too. <laughs> Let's see, um, I was in a show with Howie Mandel a long time ago called Bobby's World. <laughs> and um, Ginny McSwain wanted me to use my Valium voice, so I was his best friend Jackie, whose mother watched Sally Jesse Raphael and had abrasions on her knees. <laughs> and then, let's hmm. see, I was, um, what, Jimmy Neutron? So, um, I had the voice for Jimmy Neutron, and I spent a lot of time in the candy bar, and I brought my hovercraft to Comic-Con so I could get around. <laughs> and I have a, a new show with Mattel called Monster High, and I do the voice for Brachiora on Monster High. And she's very nice. And then, let's see, um, I get to follow uh, in the footsteps of the fabulous... <laughs> Dick Beals, God rest his soul, passed away, one of our greatest voice actors. And I am the new voice of Speedy Alka Seltzer. So I'm the... Oh, oh, this is all I really fit is... guy. <laughs> One of my first series, and I was the first voice of Tinkerbell. Hmm. And it was the first time she ever spoke on TV. And she sounded sort of like this. She was kind of bitchy, and every time I talked, I went cross-eyed. And Tim Curry said, 
Did you know that every time you speak, you go cross-eyed? <laughs> Jim Curry used to throw uh, stuff at the kids, it, uh, paper clips and paper butt. And he would see when the director wasn't looking and then he would throw stuff. <laughs> and the kids weren't sophisticated enough to notice. <laughs> and they would throw them back and every, they all got in trouble. The kids got in trouble. Kid, yeah, Tim, Tim, Tim did no wrong. <laughs> he called them little skunks. <laughs> and then, um, mm -hmm. Obscure. Okay, um, back when I was doing Bobby's World, there was this movie called Free Willy, the first one. And they needed a scuba diver who was short and who could body double the little boy and drown with the whale and get lifted up. So I went to Warner Brothers and they hired me on the spot and flew me to Mexico City and I was the body stunt double for the boy in Free Willy. When he's drowning, if you pause, he's got hips. Uh, Matthew, you're on. Yes, uh, well, as the relative newcomer to all these great voices, I don't have quite the lineage per se, and what I can talk about from projects that haven't been announced yet is going to be a little frustrating. Uh, but things you may know me from, uh, from the video game world. Uh, I do a lot of orcs and creatures in World of Warcraft for uh, a while now. Um, let's see, uh, uh, you guys also may have heard of the new Mortal Kombat, which came out recently. Yeah! Where uh, I was the voice of Curtis Stryker. Yeah! <laughs> the, uh, hopefully trying to bring the SWAT guy back in the, uh, the respectable range. <laughs> um, also, uh, the new Thundercats and Cartoon Network, I'm the voice of Tigra. I did examples of these too. Uh, I go back to Curtis Strike. It was more of like a, hey, police brutality coming up. <laughs> Busted! You know, that kind of stuff. Um, Tiger, I was more of like a, now you see me, now you don't. Or a, <laughs> face it, little brother. When it comes to the crown, you'll always be second place. <laughs> He's not a good example of an older brother in some cases. <laughs> uh, kind of a mean guy. Um, Your button is clicking. My button is clicking. Can I just pull this up? You can okay. do that. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, hmm. I'll get you on the Uh Also, uh, let's see what I can talk about. Uh, Zway in Soul Calibur V. Thank you, the person. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they recently released uh, Full Metal Alchemist movie, Sacred Star of Milos. Uh, hey, Melvin Voyager. Uh, has a very tumultuous character, but uh, he's, he's one of those kind of, you know, really low and, and interesting soft voice characters that gets a little darker as it progresses and a little crazier, which is fun. <laughs> um, and then uh, I can now talk about it because they announced it yesterday. I'm the uh, voice of Leon Kennedy in Resident Evil 6. Woo! Um, he's, he's more in the eye. Uh, wow, this is just like Raccoon City all over again. <laughs> Quick, hell out of this way. Uh, this is not my lucky day. <laughs> he's got all these wonderful cheesy lines. <laughs> um, as far as obscure goes, uh, years ago I did some voice matching for Ian McKellen as Gandalf. Hmm. Um, which let me tell you, nothing's, one of the wonderful things about voiceover is it's not based on visual casting, so you get pulled in for things that people wouldn't normally cast you on based on that. So when I walked in, the director and the producer were like... <laughs> what? I'm sorry, what's your name again? Uh, and then of course you get in the booth and it's this whole, like, you know, fool of a talk! Tell yourself for next time and witness your stupidity. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> so, uh, they didn't bother me after that, so <laughs> I'm just glad that. So yeah, that's hmm. that's Thank the fun. Thank you, Matthew. <laughs> Chuck, how long have you been in this business? I want to order two orders of tempura from him. <laughs> I've been in the business uh, about 71 years. <laughs> Give it take a week or two. <laughs> Tell us, the, the, the thing about this stuff is amazing. His, his cartoon voices are only one of about 93 things he does, but he does cartoon voices very well. Tell him some shows you've been on doing cartoon voices. All right. Um, the first, uh, DuckTales. 
I was, uh, uh, the Duckworth. Oh dear, Master Newey Dewey. Scrooge will be now, Scrooge will be home. Or I was the Beagle Boys, Baker. <laughs> and I'm the voice of the thing, Ben Grimm. It's club time! Uh, I'm the voice of Leatherneck with G.I. Joe, yeah. which has been on for years. And give me a. a oh, the voice. That, that was a rip voice, I'll tell you, by the time we got finished. That. And then I'm uh, with a lot of uh, animation, too. Uh, voice of Hot Cocoa Puffs. Come here, Sonny, get your Cocoa Puffs. Hot Cake Rams, Yahoo! Hot Cocoa Puffs. Yeah, <laughs> that'll tear your throat out. Uh, and uh, the Kibbles and Bits dog. Give him some bits, more bits, more bits, more Kibbles and Bits. I'll tell you a funny story about that one. Uh, I walked in, uh, uh, the commercial was on for about uh, six months, almost a year. And uh, they were, it was really a big commercial. Uh, and it was on forever. And all of a sudden it disappeared. And I was called back about another three months later and to record the same thing again. And I said, what? Why do I have to record it again? They said, oh, we had a problem. A lot of little old ladies, as the dog was walking down the alley, you could see the testicles on the door. <laughs> so we had to airbrush them out. <laughs> so I said, does that mean I have to do the voice higher? <laughs> <laughs> but I did, uh, I did a lot of uh, Laurel and Hardy, I did, uh, Stan Laurel was like my dearest friend, he was like my father, Laurel and Hardy, and I hope you guys, if you want to laugh, go in and look at the new box set that just came out on Laurel and Hardy. If you haven't... And I'd like to do them kind of for you. Say, Ollie, what's that mean? What does this remind you of? I haven't the faintest idea. What is that supposed to remind me of? Well, you see, that reminds me of Thursday. There's Monday, Tuesday, <laughs> Wednesday, Thursday. <laughs> This is the shortest science fiction film ever made. The shortest science fiction film ever made.
from Mr. Pickles, the drama teacher. And Doug Dimmodome, the Dimsdale Dimmodome, and various uh, <laughs> other characters. I uh, worked with Steve on Wolverine and the X-Men. And um, I was Dr. X. And originally they didn't want us to do actual, you know, dead on impressions of the original guys until I heard Tom Kane doing his perfect Ian McKellen. The ring must be destroyed! And so I decided to go full on, you know, Picard with uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, Captain Picard to the bridge. <whistles> Captain Picard to the bridge. <whistles> I'm doing number two, number one. Do you mind? <laughs> Office rubbing in toilet paper it really chops my hide. Uh, let's see what else went um, on. I've actually got my IMDb page to try. Of course! Let's see what else. Oh, I, one of my favorite things to do was called Secret Files of the Spy Dogs many years ago. Uh, and the best part was I was sitting right between Adam West, Batman, and Mickey Dolenz, a monkey, and we were all playing dogs. You know. <laughs> Billy West was also involved with that. Uh, yeah, I played Angus doing the Scots accent. It didn't sound a bit like Sean Connery. I was tempted to do that. The whole place stinks like a whole house at low tide. <laughs> um, something <laughs> obscure I've done. Oh, let's see here. Um, oh, well, I, uh, one of my first voiceover jobs actually was um, doing the voice of Kit from Mike Leiter in an episode of Different Strokes. Hmm. I was actually working at Universal Studios at the time. I was one of the guys sitting in the box talking to the kids in the car uh, as Wayne Daniels. And uh, I, they had us all audition for this thing, and, and I got it. They weren't going to pay Willie Daniels his fee, because he was, you know, between Knight Rider and St. Elsewhere. But uh, the fun part about that, initially, was that, you know, we were talking to the kid inside the car, and the speaker was on. We first, <laughs> initially we had the ability to turn the outside speaker off so we could tell the kids to, you know, where to go if they were being obnoxious. But they, they caught on to that <laughs> fairly quickly. <big. laughs> and we had to just bite our tongues when they said something horrible or obnoxious, which was most of the time. Uh, I, even before that, I uh, worked for a company that did answering machine messages mm -hmm. in different uh, celebrity voices. Uh, and I feel a little bad about this because Sylvester, Stallone's son recently died, but uh, Stallone actually called the company, I hope you can hear this, uh, <laughs> imitating me, imitating him, and he goes on something like this. Of, of Sly Storm. And if you listen closely, you could hear Dolly Parton squealing in the background because they were, they were working on, uh, what was it, the rhinestone? Was it the rhinestone at the time, yeah. Hmm. Uh, uh, similarly, I work on a radio show called The Stephanie Miller Show. Uh, hmm. Sidekick there. Sorry, no, of course, guy. Yeah, oh, hello. Some people listen to the radio. We are also now on current TV, Al Gore's little outfit. And Stephanie thought it'd be fun when Al Gore called in <laughs> for me to do him to him. And now, well, so, wow, that's somewhere between uncanny and canny. <laughs> hmm. So that's fairly obscure. Okay, thank you, Jim. <laughs> Now, let me do a brief commercial here before we proceed to the next thing. We have another cartoon voice panel uh, tomorrow, as it turns out, in room 6A at uh, 11.30. And we will be talking then with Dee Bradley Baker, Rob Paulson, Audrey Wesolewski, Greg Tattashore, Greg Berger, and Misty Lee. Couldn't find anybody good. Oh, wow. That's right. <laughs> interested, there's probably is somebody in this room somewhere who's interested in a career in cartoon voices. Um, we have set up a special panel that I started doing a couple of years ago. Uh, it's, it's, it's called The Business of Cartoon Voices. Uh, it was set up, we set up, uh, there's a gentleman who used to co-host with these with me named, named Earl Kress, who was a lovely animation writer, a wonderful man, some of you know Earl, and uh, he wasn't here last year because he was home uh, battling cancer, and he's not here this year because he lost. But one of the things he, that he came in at one point and said, you know, there's people out there who are 
there, there's some wonderful voice coaches, wonderful voice teachers, people who help people build careers. There's also people who take large sums of money for giving you bad advice or the kind of stuff you should be able to get for free. So we do a panel at, uh, on Sunday here at the convention at 3 o'clock every year called The Business of Cartoon Voices. It's not for entertainment, nobody performing voices there. It's agents, managers, demos, how to get a career, classes. If you are interested in, we have, we have some wonderful people. I think, Debbie, you're joining us for this tomorrow, aren't you? What time is that? I, I, I think you're, you're uh, Debbie is, I forget who's got that. It's tomorrow at 3 o'clock. I might be, yep. Okay, yeah, anyway, we've got some, some agents and folks. Anyway, if you're interested in that, get to that panel and we'll give you for free the advice that some people would charge you thousands of dollars for. Anyway. Mm -hmm. We are now going to demonstrate what these people do for a living with what is called a cold reading. They have not seen the script. Actually, a couple of them. One, one, Chuck has seen the script before because this is the same script we did last year. <laughs> I decided this, this oh, as an experiment. Funny. Yes, but you get, different, you get different roles this time. The rest of you have not seen this script. And um, usually you get a little more prep time uh, before, they, before we record these people. But today we're going to throw this at them cold. Uh, this is the script, this is the story of Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. I am going to, to assign the roles out here now, and, um, ooh, we got, we got script, we, we got pencils, pass pencils down, everybody. I'm curious. <laughs> All right. Come. All right. <laughs> Sharp and pointed! Come yes. All right, Chuck. Yes, Chuck. You are playing dwarf number two, dwarf number six, and the huntsman. Walk number two, walk number six, and the hunch. hunch. All right. All right. You are playing dwarf number one, dwarf number five, and the prince. All righty. Debbie, congratulations, you're Snow White. Yes. <laughs> no dwarfs for her? <laughs> no. Jack, you get dwarf number four and the magic mirror. You get dwarf number three, dwarf number seven, and the priest. Thank God. <laughs> April, I'm sorry to tell you, you're the evil queen. Yeah, what else is there? It's kind of my thing. You're the narrator, and the narrator has about 15 lines in here. I would like everyone in a different voice. Every, every uh, narrator line, dialect, or impression, or whatever he's got left. Mm. We'll give these people a moment to mark their scripts. But only a moment. And I will play director if I think you are off someplace, I may stop you and ask you to change what you're doing. Or I may just let you go. Uh, this is a very boring script. Anything funny you hear in here, in, this, in what happens now, was not in the script. <laughs> is a, uh, an adaptation of uh, Snow White, the entirety of it cut down to 97 lines. Hmm. I once edited it couple of episodes of the Lone Ranger radio show down to one minute. Wow. And you could follow the whole story. <laughs> Wait, we're, we're reading this out loud? What? <laughs> Actors all have these certain mystical ways of marking their scripts in codes to tell them which lines are which and which voices are theirs. Underline, sometimes they draw lines where they're gonna breathe in the middle of the speeches and things like that. If we have time. If you have time. Unveiled. There we go. Chuck and, Chuck and April have been on shows I've directed. They will tell you that I don't give them much more time than this. <laughs> we used to do radio in radio. You don't know what radio, it's TV. <laughs> TV with the tube blown out, you know? <laughs> and we used to do it, and we'd have like 60 pages on a script, and it was live, you know? Live, there was no tape, no, no, nothing. 
And one time, I get up to my script, and I went, and now I... <laughs> Page one, page two, oh man, that's nightmares. Nightmares. <laughs> now we've got this. All right, we're gonna start. Jim, you have the first line. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, the story of Snow White. <laughs> Should I announce the people I'm doing now? Let me figure it out. Once upon a time. Long, long ago, there was an evil queen who studied dark magic. She was very vain, and each day she would go to her magic mirror and ask the same question. Magic mirror on the wall, who is the fairest one of all? And each time the mirror would give her the same reply. <laughs> Thou, O oh queen, art the fairest of all. This pleased the queen greatly. <laughs> As she knew that her magical mirror could speak naught but the truth, that one day the answer changed. Magic mirror on the wall, who's the fairest one of all? You, my queen, are fair, it is true, but Snow White is even fairer than you. What? <laughs> <laughs> How dare she! Snow White was her stepdaughter. Her sister, her stepdaughter, her sister, her stepdaughter. Glass of extraordinary beauty that had recently blossomed. <laughs> what is wrong, stepmother dear? No, nothing's new, I dare. <laughs> she summoned her huntsman to the rear chambers <laughs> and, and gave him an order. Take Snow White into the forest and kill her. Shut up. Yeah. Oh, I said. I sure am. Up. <laughs> Yeah, 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 there we go. Sorry. Oh, your majesty. <laughs> oh, heavens to Betsy. I cannot do such a thing. What do I look like, anyway? <laughs> you will follow my orders, huntsman, and you will bring her heart me as proof you have complied. <laughs> the huntsman took Snow White into the forest to join him, managed to draw his knife before his conscience seized control. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Up a nice heart there. <laughs> I cannot do it. Okay, um, you're drawing on me a little. Um, can, can I do what, noble huntsman? No, your voice is so high, high only dogs can hear it. <laughs> I cannot kill you as the queen ordered. <gasps> Can you kill me? The queen wishes me death? <laughs> no, don't you understand? <laughs> you listen carefully. It's jealousy, Snow White. Now, you must run. Run deep into the forest and hide. <laughs> Take your little barometer thing from your cheek. Well, with you and so you don't get lost in you. And I, <laughs> I don't want you to get lost in your high voice, 
and beautiful one. So I'm going to take the heart of a wild boar. Now let me see, what boar do I know? <laughs> I, I'll tell it that it's yours. Look in the mirror. <laughs> My life. Protection. 
can stir and she can stay here as long as she likes. <laughs> as long as she has scotch. <laughs> And so Snow White stayed with the dwarves, cooking and cleaning for them. It was a fine arrangement until the next day when the queen asked a mirror, Magic mirror on the wall, who's the fairest one of all? You, my queen, no. are fair, it is true. But Snow White, living in the mountains with the seven dwarves, <laughs> is still quite shopworn, as you may imagine. thousand times fairer than you. W-T-F! Don't put it in the 
having a gob of Jupin cooking. <laughs> hey, what's wrong with my cooking? <laughs> Nothing. As long as you don't have to eat it. <laughs> Over, burn! <laughs> but don't fight men. Now that we're home, let's be pleasant for Snow White. <laughs> and that is when we saw her. <laughs> gas, gas. <laughs> Stage gas. <laughs> With all their might, but it was too late. That left me with a sad task of cutting in half with a lightsaber. <laughs> it's not that's not Well, what are we gonna do? Bury it or cremate it? Yeah, yeah, no, no, we can't do that. No, look at those rosy cheeks, that fair skin, you gonna bury that, are you crazy? Eh, <laughs> dead of form, but not of spirit. <laughs> <laughs> what can we do? <laughs> I don't know. I say she smells pretty good, let's eat her. <laughs> we could make a coffin of gold and glass or something. <laughs> Yes, we will build it out of love and respect. <laughs> I like gold and glass better. <laughs> Such a coffin was built that they placed Snow White still full inside. All day and all night, at least one dwarf stood vigil upon it. And then one day, many months later, a stranger happened by. Who are you? Yes. Hmm. Oh, Kid, yes. I should probably circle that in my notes. I am Prince John of the kingdom over yonder hill. I have heard of a maiden fair of form and beauty. That, obviously, is she. <coughs> oh, uh, well, I'm afraid, uh... Princey, uh, too late. Yeah, you it's know. It's assumed room temperature. <laughs> it would take a miracle to revive that. Have you a miracle, your majesty? <laughs> Only the miracle of true love. Stand aside, my good men, and watch a man at work. <laughs> <laughs> the prince. Oh, the gasket of gold glass. Uh, <laughs> applied a loving kiss to the lips that were red as blood. <laughs> For long moments, nothing happened but that. They called Priceline.com. shall make my bride if you will have me. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh my course. Yay! Thank God you get her the high I didn't think this through. <laughs> and so they were married. That was good and fat, but all that, you know. How would the evil queen attempted to attend the ceremony? You know, I mean, Heather, the unit extra slack. <laughs> the prince. Had a season thrown into the dungeon, it was all very dark and aki and all that. It wasn't very fun. Do you, Prince John, take this woman to be your bride? Well, it's a big decision. Say yes. I, 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 I got another do, wedding right after this. Hurry <laughs> up. I do, I do. We're, we're good. <laughs> Did you answer? 
Yes, yeah. I did. Okay, good. Sorry. Can, can I take it back? Okay. Oh. You can change your mind. <laughs> too late. Okay. And do you, Snow White, take this man to be your groom? Yeah. yeah. Oh. <laughs> I really, totally do. Whoever thought that someone would ask me to get married? My mom said no one would because I have a funny laugh. job. <laughs> you poor All right, finally, I now pronounce you man and wife. You may kiss the bride. How sharp is that ass, Mr. Dwarf? And soon, they lived happily ever mm. after, until a terrible plague fell upon the land and they all died and the bodies turned black. <laughs> <laughs> You'll see an entirely different interpretation, and probably they'll put in about 183 dwarfs also. <laughs> uh, I want to talk a little bit here a moment about uh, veteran voice actors. Uh, we love veteran voice actors, people who've done it for years. One of the nice things about cartoon voices, they live on forever. Somebody asked me last year at uh, the car business cartoon voice panel, who is the person who has been doing cartoon voices the longest, who's still at it? Well, the first runner-up, the number two person, I figured this all out, is a woman named June Ferre. Mm. I will tell the story in slightly greater detail at the panel tomorrow, but a couple weeks ago, I got to escort June Ferre to the Daytime Emmy Awards, where she became, she won her first ever Emmy Award, wow. becoming the oldest recipient of an Emmy Award ever, beating out that bitch Betty White by five years. <laughs> June is still working. She's on the Garfield show with me. She's on the Looney Tunes show playing Granny at the age of 94. Wow. She's the voice track to a new Rocky and Bullwinkle cartoon that is coming out later this year. Voices the longest. Number one, I believe, Freeberg. is a man I mentioned earlier, one of my heroes, a man named Stan Freeberg. Yay! Stan, some of you know Stan Freeberg best because in the 60s and 70s and the 80s, he was responsible. Every funny commercial you saw on TV was either produced by Stan Freeberg or was produced by an advertising agency that was trying to imitate Stan Freeberg. <laughs> but he would, before that, in the 50s, he and Dawes Butler, sometimes with Dawes, sometimes on his own, he had some of the best-selling comedy records ever done in the world uh, that he produced. Um, and the St. George of the Ranks, the first million-selling comedy albums ever. Before that, he started doing cartoon voices at a very early age, and he was the other guy in all the Warner Brothers cartoons for years. Mel Blanc got Soul Billy, but there were other people in there, Arthur Hugh Bryant and Elmer Fudd. An awful lot of the other voices were done by Stan. He was Pete Puma in, the, in, the, in that rabbit skin cartoon. He was um, uh, Junior Bear, and he was like a legend of our business. He is at this convention, and you can go down and see him at, uh, let me see the number here, Booth GG13. He's down there with his lovely wife, uh, Hunter, and you can tell him how much we appreciate his work. Or you can tell him right now, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Stan Freeberg. <laughs> Mark Evanier. Excuse me, I'm sorry. He's 
one of the most brilliant directors I ever worked with. He writes and directs the Garfield show, in which I appear, and it's doing several voices every time. And uh, among other things, Something, something majestic happening behind us in, this, in, the, in the next room. Would you tell them to go hold it down? St Stan, um, thank you for coming yeah. up and joining us. And, and by the way, do, when you get a chance, go down to, to table uh, GG13 and meet him in person. He's got his autobiography there and some wonderful CDs and photos. This man was the original voice of Cecil the C6 Sea Serpent. <laughs> Stan, I want you to tell us briefly, how old were you when you started doing cartoon voices? I was 18 years old. All right, tell us, you decided to get into the business one day and you yeah, had a bus. You, you want me to do the bus story? Tell about the bus. Okay. <clears throat> when I was 18 years old, I won three California speech, uh, and, uh, California state speech championships. And for that, I was awarded a scholarship to Redlands University. No, at Stanford, I'm sorry, I could have had either Redlands or Stanford, I chose Stanford. Okay, so uh, my father was a um, Baptist minister, and uh, he, he said, uh, I, I said, before I go to, to Stanford, Dad, I just want to see if I can find an agent and break into show business. He said, well, that would be very, very difficult. I said, well, we'll see what happens. So I got a, a, the Asbury Rapid Transit is a bus from Pasadena, and we, well, I'm going into Hollywood now. I'm driving down Hollywood Boulevard. I'm the old, last guy left on the bus. And the bus driver says, where do you want to get off, kid? I said, I want to get off in the middle of Hollywood. Psh, hits the brakes. I said, is this the middle? He says, kid, this is as middle as it gets. Okay, so now I get off the bus at the corner of Whitley and Hollywood Boulevard. And uh, there's an orange Julius stand in front and I have a little lunch, my mother packed me, and now I get in the elevator. I, I looked on the index and it said uh, dry cleaning, invisible weaving, and then it says talent agency, stars of tomorrow, stars of tomorrow. I said, that's me, stars of tomorrow. <laughs> so I get in the creaky elevator, uh, going up. Finally, I get you know, stars of tomorrow on the door. I walk in, I said, hello, stars of tomorrow, this woman, walked out with, with a, a white, wide shoulder pad like Eve Arden used to wear, and a little guy <laughs> with a cigar. They said, yeah, can we help you? I said, yes, I'd like to see somebody about representation. I don't know where I got that word at that point. <laughs> so I said, what do you do? I said, well, I do a lot of voices. And I said, l l l for example, like what? I said, well, I do uh, FDR, uh, Franklin Roosevelt. Yesterday, December 7th, a day that will live in infamy. And Jimmy Durante, everybody wants to get into the act. And the dee, the dee, the dee, the dee, that's all, folks. <laughs> she says, stop, okay? Let's all pray. <laughs> now, no kidding, and we all held hands. I thought, well, this must be how they open every day at William Morris. <laughs> <laughs> she said, dear, uh, dear Lord, help this young man stand uh, Freeberg, I said, straightening it out for the Lord. Uh, to be, to do whatever he wants to do. In, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you. So now, <clears throat> she says, uh, have you ever considered animated cartoons, getting into animated cartoons? I said, no, it never occurred to me. She walks into the office, picks up the phone, and calls a man named John Burton at Warner Brothers Cartoons. She said, I'm, I'm bringing a very talented young man you've never met over right now. Pause. Yeah, I know Mel, you, Mel, yeah, Mel Blank, but Mel Blank can't do all the voices in the world. So <laughs> I'm coming on. So I now she, she drives me over to uh, Warner Brothers Cartoons, and uh, uh, there's John Burton out in, the, out in the hall. So I, I, I start doing voices for him. He says, "Stop. Can you come back tomorrow?" I thought, "Oh, I'm bombing." He said, no, can you come back tomorrow and do the same thing for our animation directors, Chuck Jones, Bob Clampett? <laughs> yeah. And uh, Chris Freeling. And I said, absolutely. So anyhow, okay, got back on the bus, went back to Pasadena. I stayed awake half the night while visions of Looney Tunes danced in my head. <laughs> and then the next morning, got up, got back on the bus, went into Hollywood. Now they have me in the, in the front of a uh, projection room, 
uh, that's now full of all the animation directors. So uh, they have a black curtain in front of me because uh, the, uh, the animation directors didn't like to see the guy doing the, they just wanted to hear the voices. So I'm scared to death. I started doing the, and uh, John Byrne said, this is a talented young man named Stan Freeberg. Go ahead, Stan. So now I start doing voices, and uh, they all started to laugh. And then I was all right once I heard all that laughter. So finally, um, he said, come on out, Stan. I walked out, and uh, uh, Bob Clampett came up to me. And later on in years, I would, I would be the co-creator, along with Bob Clampett, of a show called Time for Beanie, Beanie and Cecil. Yeah. yeah. And I was the voice of Dishonest John. <laughs> and the world's meanest crumb. And I'm coming, Beanie Boy, I'm coming. Anyhow. So, uh, yeah, so, uh, so Clampett, I thought it would be funny to have uh, FDR's dog, which was called uh, Fala, uh, talk like Roosevelt. It's funny to have the dog talk like Roosevelt, so he, uh, so he hired me. So now uh, Chuck Jones came up to me, put his arm around me and said, um, I, I, I'm doing a thing called the Three Bears, and I want you to do uh, the voice of the baby bear. Did I do a good thing, Paul? You know, <laughs> okay. So, so uh, that's fine. So, so now a man named Fritz Freeling, who would later, later create the Pink Panther series, walks up to me and says, why haven't we heard of you before, Stan? I said, I don't know, I've been around, you know. <laughs> Just graduated high school two weeks before. So Fritz Freeling said to me, oh, I didn't mean that the way it sounded. I'm sure you didn't just get off the bus. <laughs> Screen Actors Guild card in my pocket, and I started doing the, the first of over 400 voices of Warner Brothers cartoons. And, uh, I would like to, could we have a little Pete Puma? Pete Puma. You give me a lot of lumps. A whole lot of lumps. <laughs> Anyhow. <laughs> voice from a, 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 a guy, a master sergeant, I was in the army at, at stationed at Fort MacArthur in San Pedro, and this master sergeant was named Tiger Brown, and he used to bully me. You Freeberg, you gold brick. You bend down and give me 20 push-ups. So I got even with him later by <laughs> using his voice for Pete Puma. Okay. And uh, then I, uh, I did... Um, um, uh, the voice of the beaver and Lady in the Tramp. And, uh, you know, uh, today somebody would come out and say, um, uh, Walt Disney would like you to come out and audition for the part of Pete Puma. I mean, of, of, of uh, uh, what, what am I saying? The beaver. The beaver, the beaver, yeah. So I had a senior moment there. <laughs> So, uh, but no, he said, uh, no, Walt thinks you'd be perfect for the voice of the beaver. So now I'm in the, in, at the microphone on Mickey Mouse Avenue or whatever the studio was. And I, I was starting to do the, uh, the script and the guy in the booth said, hold it, Stan, Walt's coming down. He wants to direct you himself. So Walt Disney came down himself. Good morning, Stan. Good morning, Walt. And uh, so... I, I, I did, he said, I think that with the beaver, I don't, unfortunately, I don't have a little um, uh, police whistle here because that's how I got the shh every, every, on every, shh, hey, take these shikamores down to the swamp. Anyhow, uh, uh, okay, so that was the voice of the beaver. <laughs> and uh, so, uh, and, and uh, Walt had the idea uh, that he, I could hit a hit and miss on the S, and hitting the S and making a, a whistle sound. So a great sound effects man named Jimmy McDonald that worked on me on an album I did called Stan Freeberg Presents the United States of America. Oh. And thank you. Uh, and uh, he, he did all the sound effects, so I, I hit the whistle every time, and, and that's how it came out perfectly. 
So let's see, what else did I did do? I, oh yeah, I did do one of the two polite gophers. After you, no, after you. Thank you, I'm sure. Mel Blanc did one and I did the other one. And then uh, once in a while, when M Mel Blanc was sick, I did uh, that's all, folks. <laughs> and uh, uh, thank you. And then uh, I, did, I did the three little bops. And uh, I, I did um, um, uh, the three little bops. I wrote all the music and, in it and did all the voices for that. And uh, see, and what he's else? still doing voices today. Yeah, still, still doing voices for you. Voice work as well. Yeah, that's right. Hey, I know. I know how to. It's when you cast people like this, a rhesus monkey could direct the sessions. It's very simple. <laughs> Distinguished cast, I wish we could go on for a while, but we've got another panel coming in here. It is amazing to have all you folks together. Have you seen a more talented group of people on this stage? <laughs>